Uh, good afternoon to my friends and colleagues in the Nigerian Society for Neuroscience. I'm very sorry not to be there. This is the second time that I've been invited to Nigeria when I haven't been allowed to come. Unfortunately, my wife is still in the hospital after seven weeks, and so I have to stay here. But I've prepared this presentation, and my student Ryan is videotaping it, and we should have it up uh, available to you as soon as possible. It's now a quarter to 11 uh, on Thursday, the 12th of November in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, the title that Philip asked me to use is Nervous System Disorders, the African Challenge. And uh, I prepared an abstract, and I'm very happy and proud and honored to be the invited speaker to the Neuroscience Society of Nigeria 13th conference, and as I said, I'm very sorry not to be there myself. Uh, I've, I've taken the talk in, in uh, 11 little parts, uh, the problem of neurological disorders in Africa, mental health in Africa, the importance of basic neuroscience for understanding neurological and mental health disorders, the integration of neuroscience, neurology and mental health, understanding the brain mechanisms underlying neurological disorders, uh, examples of applications of neuroscience to repairing brain damage, and then a, a short overview of my paper that I published some years ago in the Ibadan Medical Journal on uh, developing a neuroscience program, uh, training how to train students for the future of neuroscience, and then some look at the importance of neuroscience in the future and the spread of neuroscience into a neuroculture and a brief conclusion. So we'll start with some data on the problem of neurological disorders in Africa. And the, the main problem is that very few data exist. It's difficult to collect data both on developmental disorders and adult disorders. The data that exists indicate that cerebral palsy, mental retardation, epilepsy, developmental delay, speech disorders, learning difficulties, uh, brain damage due to infection and cerebral malaria are all uh, developmental disorders found throughout Africa. In adults, there's peripheral neuropathy, stroke, dementia, movement disorders, headache, head trauma, neurological complications of HIV infection, alcohol, drug abuse, and others. And so Africa has the same pattern of uh, mental health disorders as the rest of the world. The data that we can find uh, come from 2006 World Bank data, which looks at neurological orders and their prevalence in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I read this slide. The factors that are producing increased burden include malnutrition, adverse perinatal conditions, malaria, HIV virus, uh, AIDS, encephalitis, meningitis, uh, demographic transitions, vehicle traffic, and regional conflicts. Uh, the kind of leading neurological disorders are those I just mentioned, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, developmental disorders, epilepsy, neuropathy, stroke, uh, nervous system complications of age, trauma, alcohol abuse, and of course diseases of aging. So the problem is that it's hard to collect data and often these neurological orders are neglected even though they may form up to 25 percent of the patients in the hospital population. Uh, there's some effort here in neurological disorders, public health challenges to look at how many Africans have neurological disorders of these that I just mentioned, adult disorders, dementia, epilepsy, headache, MS, neuroinfections, uh, malnutrition, neuro logical pain, Parkinson's stroke, traumatic brain injuries, etc. And they published a number of tables in this book. And here it's a daily adjusted life years. This is the prevalence per 1,000 people of neuro, ne I'm sorry, prevalence per 1,000 of neurological disorders by case. And you see they have a world estimate from 2005, 2015, and a prediction for 2030 they have the world, and they have Africa. And if you look 
the prevalence of epilepsy is much higher in Africa than in the world in general. Prevalence of um, neuroinfections is higher. Prevalence of nutritional and neuropathology is higher. Prevalence of neurological injuries is higher. In some cases, it's almost double the rest of the world. On the other hand, other cases of uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis and migraine are less than in the rest of the world, at least with the data that's been collected. So there's an interesting pattern. Diseases of aging are less in Africa, but as people live longer, those diseases will increase in frequency. There are a number of papers. This is a 2014 paper on epidemiology of neurodegenerative diseases in Sub-Saharan Africa, trying to estimate the number of people and thus the required uh, hospital and uh, uh, nursing and doctor resources that would be required. And they looked at different publications for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, HIV, Huntington's, ALS, cerebellar degeneration, Lewy body dementia. And, but the, the estimates range for Alzheimer's, for example, from less than 1% of the population to 10% of the population. So the data are extremely variable. And so it needs better data. Uh, the body of literature on neurodegenerative diseases in Sub-Saharan Africa is large with regard to dementia and HIV, uh, but limited for other neurodegenerative diseases. So it's uh, imperative to collect this epidemiological data. And mental health in Africa, as opposed to neurological damage, mental health is in the same situation. Very hard to collect data on mental health disorders. And a push uh, in the Global Health uh, Report for 2014 to include uh, mental health care in general health the issues in Africa. And so we we come to the to the problem of how to integrate uh, neurology and mental health issues into general health in Africa. And here's the African Mental Health Foundation, uh, founded by David Nadetti in Nairobi, looking at uh, the most common mental health disorders, anxiety, mood disorders, depression, suicide, schizophrenia, substance abuse, post-traumatic stress, and mental health of the elderly. And this organization trying to put forward a program for treating mental health in Africa. Well, in the last five years, since around 2010, in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, there's been a push to look at neurological and mental health disorders in light of basic neuroscience. And this article in Science uh, 2010 really started the, what you might think of the neuroscience revolution in understanding neurological and mental health disorders. It was published by a number of uh, outstanding researchers, including Nobel Prize winner Eric Kandel, among others. And it basically says, if we're going to look at neurological and mental health psychiatric research, we should be looking at how neural circuits are disrupted and how genetics are involved with neural circuits. And so that set the tone for research into the mental health and brain disorders for the last five years. Here's Alan Leshner, an editorial in Science in 2013, uh, saying that we should seize the neuroscience moment. That in Europe, they've launched the Human Brain Project. In the United States, brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies. And around the world, people are putting efforts into neuroscience to understand brain disorders. Uh, in many governments in the United States and Europe, uh, there are policymakers who are championing, championing neuroscience and advocating funding and treatment for basic neuroscience and its application to human clinical disorders. And the big question is, uh, is there government support for neuroscience research in Africa? Recently, I was in the University of Birmingham in England to start their new neuroscience program, and there was one student from Botswana 
who said she had to fight her government to get a scholarship to go to England to study neuroscience uh, because they didn't see the importance of neuroscience. So it's clearly imperative throughout Africa, throughout all the countries in Africa, to indicate to governments and, and education authorities and others of why neuroscience is important. And I hope this talk will help to explain that. I've sent my slides to Philip Adenye, and you'll be getting this talk very soon. Another editorial in the Journal Annals of Neurology last year, 2014, talks about the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in the United States and how they're pressing uh, to support research which advances fundamental understanding of the nervous system, that is, support basic neuroscience, the foundation from which to explore disease mechanisms and devise new treatments for patients. So many different societies are realizing that uh, the future of studying brain disorders is uh, basic neuroscience. Here this year in Lancet Psychiatry 2015, uh, the push for global mental health in neuroscience and how neuroscience can be involved in global mental health uh, as a specialty. So this focuses on translational neuroscience, which I'll talk about shortly. How neurocircuits, molecular basis of mental disorders can be studied, genetics underlying these, and how then new treatments can be devised on a world health uh, point of view. So this reviews approaches of global mental health and clinical neuroscience to the diagnosis, pathogenesis, and intervention, and makes recommendations for integrating these perspectives of so Lancet Psychiatry 2015. I've tried on each slide to put the exact reference on the lower right corner. Sometimes it's in other places, but you can Google these uh, citations or use PubMed and find the exact articles that I'm referring to. Well, in December 2012, I was part of a conference organized by Raj Kalaria in, in Nairobi in the beautiful Safari Park Hotel on brain aging and dementia uh, in Africa and other countries. And uh, many uh, people from around the world were there. Here am I, here Sam, many of you remember meeting her there. And out of this conference, uh, you see a paper with uh, 23 authors or something from around the world led by uh, uh, Aske Anand and Raj Kaleria in England where we looked at how to translate preclinical uh, animal research studies into successful clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease and, and what the roadblocks were. And throughout the rest of the talk in this section on basic neuroscience, neurology, and mental health, we'll be focusing on this translational research. And since I'm doing research on Alzheimer's disease, and much, much of my discussion, many of my examples, will be about Alzheimer's disease. And so preclinical studies, animal research, is essential for translation to disease treatments in humans. The problem is, that many drugs have failed for Alzheimer's disease. And how can we stop this failure and get some successful drugs? Well, greater efforts are necessary to fill in the gaps, overcome a variety of confounds in the generation, study design, testing and evaluation of animal models, and application to future novel anti-dementia drug trials. So here is a case of a very international group coming together in Nairobi and producing this document uh, that's now published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease this year, 2015, so two years in the writing virtually. And this uh, shows how the gears work. Basic research is fundamental. So we develop methods in the laboratory and they get translated to pa uh, patients and then to healthcare practice and decision making. So that process, although it looks simple, can take 10 or 15 years. Uh, in between, there are many problems, barriers for clinical translation from animal to humans in Alzheimer's disease. So good animal practice, randomization and blind studies are necessary, uh, controls for confounds, and long-term perspectives in studies, 
studies of aging, lifetime uh, developmental studies rather than using young animals to model diseases of older people, ignorance of risk factors in animal studies, uh, pathophysiological dissimilarities between some animal models and humans, phylogenetic diversity, multiple animal models, but there's, there's not one perfect animal model for Alzheimer's disease. There's many that are good. Limited investigations of A, beta, and other pathologies. Pharmaceutical uh, limitations, the problem of the blood-brain barrier, standardized treatments, slow progress in diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, lack of discussion between scientists and clinicians, gaps in tri clinical trial designs and poor statistical analyses, and limited genetic information in clinical practice. These are uh, some of the factors that we discuss in the problem of getting a, a drug that may seem to have a good effect in an animal model to uh, clinical trials with humans. Well, in 2002, uh, Steve Hyman from Harvard was writing about what's necessary to change the classification system for psychiatric disorders. And he was writing about the necessity of including basic neuroscience in what's now published as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, the DSM-5. And so he says basically, again, fundamental advances in understanding of genetic and environmental determinants of disease risk and neural circuitry supporting normal and pathological mental processes uh, promise to form the basis of improved classification of psychiatric diseases in the decades to come. And so this was used in the development of the DSM-5, but there are other instruments used for classifying uh, mental health disorders. Uh, this is the Research Domain Criteria Classification System, uh, published in 2013 toward the future of psychiatric diagnosis. This seven pillars of the research domain criterion, which involve neurobiology and behavioral analyses. And what are these seven domains, seven pillars? Uh, that's in the next slide. So this new system uh, based on genetics, neuroscience, and behavioral science. So genes, brain, and behavior. A dimensional approach to psychopathology, looking at normal to abnormal, both in neurology and mental health disorders. Reliable and valid measurement scales to measure uh, mental disorders. Designs for clinical studies of how to use sampling techniques and design particular independent variables and statistical analyses. Placing equal weight on behavioral dysfunction and neural circuitry underlying these disorders and concentrating on constructs for which there's solid empirical scientific evidence in order to redefine a number of different mental health disorders and neurological disorders in a pattern. In terms of developmental disorders, uh, often neglected uh, mental health disorders and neurological disorders of children in 2004, B.J. Casey and others uh, wrote this review in Trends in Cognitive Neuroscience on Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience, uh, the progress and potential for trying to understand brain, uh, genes, brain, and behavior in development. So some of the things they're interested in in uh, developmental cognitive neuroscience, what are the interrelations between developmental changes in the brain, I see neural connections, brain chemistry, neuro neuromorphology, and developmental changes in children's behavior and cognitive abilities, such as being able to pay attention, learning, memory, social behavior, language learning, etc. Why and how is learning enhanced during certain sensitive periods in development, and how can damage to the brain hinder this uh, learning during sensitive periods of development? And how is knowledge organized in the brain during development? And how does it change as the child ages? Uh, classical questions of developmental psychology and developmental neuroscience. Well, since 2009, I've been a member of NeuroDevNet, which is a Canadian society 
developed by Dan Goldwitz and a number of other Canadians to look at diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of neurodevelopmental disabilities in children. And so the vision of NeuroDevNet, which I'm going to say I'm a proud member of, I'm, I'm on the education committee, is to improve outcomes through research that will improve the lives of children with neural disabilities and look at that, their social, economic, and health benefits. So there's a research wing of NeuroDevNet, a training wing, and a business and developmental wing that interacts uh, with governments and non-government agencies, volunteer agencies, parents, and others. And there's an annual meeting each year uh, in Canada for NeuroDevNet. And this is the sort of thing which maybe one should look at in Africa developing something like this. Well, NeuroDevNet uh, is only one agency that's interested in neurodevelopmental disorders. I'm part of another international consortium. Here I am, uh, author number 22 out of 24. Alan Kalioff put together this consortium to look at improving treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders. Again, by looking at preclinical animal studies and how they're used uh, in, in uh, developing new ways of treating developmental disorders. Uh, so the problem is, of course, neurodevelopmental disorders are debilitating, they're chronic, they have both genetic and environmental factors. And so in this paper, we look at different patterns of neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism, intellectual disability, speech disorders, motor and tic disorders, ADHD, etc. Look at the development of drugs and other treatments, and then try and suggest ways of doing research that would improve new drugs for these treatments. A stronger emphasis on targeting multiple endophenotypes, better dissection of genetic epigenetic factors, hidden hair ability, and a careful consideration of the roles of transmitters and other neurochemicals. And so, in the last few years then, there's been a push, both in Canada and internationally, to look at neurodevelopmental disorders. And I say that this would be important in Africa. Here then is some of the diagrams from this paper of Alan Caio F. Sinaris, uh, on the different types of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, that, that focus on different types of therapy in the paper for these disorders. And then uh, the issue of the different stages of development, of neural proliferation, nerve migration, synaptogenesis, myelination, and neurogenesis, and how uh, damage or drugs or chemicals or toxins or uh, brain damage at different ages can affect different patterns of brain development. And so the effect is on language, social behavior, repetitive behaviors, uh, aggression, cognitive deficiencies, etc., and how to improve these with new drugs. What's interesting about this paper is that we've looked at comorbidities, how often one or more, two or more of these disorders occur together in depression, obsessive compulsive disorders psychoses, etc. And so, in this paper, which is in press, in expert review and drug therapy, I forget the journal, that's it. Uh, but the focus, and you can write me and I can give you the reference, I'm sorry, I, I didn't have it when I prepared the talk, it just got accepted. The focus, again, is on animal models, whether it's fruit flies, zebra fish, chicks, uh, rats and mice or primates uh, as the focus is on how to convert the animal models and the new drugs developed with animal models to clinical uh, practice uh, using ideas from genetics, epigenetics, uh, in vitro uh, cell culture studies, etc. And so the, the, the gears of uh, neuroscience move on to treat clinical neurodevelopmental disorders. Well, what exactly are these brain mechanisms that we talk about? How can we begin to dissect that what's going on in brain development 
in neurodevelopmental disorders and in adult neurological and mental health disorders. Well, this is a paper by uh, David Sweat. It's an older paper, 2002. I keep asking him to rewrite it, where he takes a, a sort of model brain cell, say a hippocampal brain cell, a cortical brain cell, and he looks at the synapses. Here's the NMDA receptors. Here's the spine synapses. And he looks at the molecular cascade of second messenger systems and how uh, Krebs, it binds to its Krebs receptors here in the DNA and how there's protein synthesis, messenger RNA, producing new proteins which uh, support the cell. And then he goes a little further and he looks at where in these different biochemical cascades things go wrong uh, to produce Engelmann syndrome, Down syndrome, Coffin-Lowry syndrome, etc., Williams syndrome, and says, well, how do we understand the neurobiology, the neurochemistry, the neurogenetics, and the epigenetics of these disorders, uh, whether it's in development or in adulthood? And then how do we develop uh, new ways of treating, of targeting these specific locations of different disorders which underlie these diseases. So this is a beautiful example of how to integrate the, the clinical disorder, the neuroscience, the neurochemistry, genetics, and epigenetics in understanding uh, the, the factors that underlie these disorders and how to develop new treatments. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with epigenetics, but know that genetics, genetics deals with mutations in DNA that are inherited through the germline, whereas epigenetics looks at modifications of the histones, chromatin, and DNA methylation and non-coding RNAs so that environmental stimuli can affect gene expression by modifying and altering these histones, uh, uh, DNA methylation, or RNA, so that it, it's a non-genetic way of causing a genetic disorder, if you will, because if the genes are, cannot be expressed, it, it's similar to a mutation, but the genes can also be overexpressed and have too much protein. So, it explains many different diseases and how they can arise spontaneously through environmental, through environmental uh, stimuli, uh, which I'm going to talk about soon. So really, uh, these days, when we talk about the genetic basis of uh, neurological and mental health disorders, we really mean genetic and epigenetic basis because the two have to be considered together. And so we really need to understand the epigenetics of disease. This is, this is the screen is going. The screen has gone dark. So here then we consider the long-term effects of environment. I mentioned the epigenetics. And many studies with uh, rats and with uh, children have shown that environment has a big effect on neural development in the visual cortex, motor cortex, cognitive regions of the brain, somatosensory regions of the brain. Here is a rats and enriched environment. Uh, so that environmental enrichment and environmental stress and isolation are some of the early events, and these include poverty, uh, war, disease, that have long-term effects on the development of the brain and behavior. And for many people looking at mental health disorders and neurological disorders, the role of the environment plays a big role. And before epigenetics, people could not really understand how simple environmental change could have an effect on brain development and circuits in the brain. In particular, there is the now uh, theory, developmental origins of health and disease theory, where 
the early environment, the early developmental environment of a child or a rat or a monkey or a chicken or even a fish or a fly, the early developmental environment shapes the brain development through epigenetic factors and so that the hippocampus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, adrenal gland, the neurochemical uh, development of the brain can be affected by things like environmental stress, uh, war, poverty, starvation, etc. And as the brain and the neurochemical systems develop, they predispose the adults to certain diseases. So a person who gets a disease when they're 40, 50, or 60, it may have started uh, right after birth. It just didn't develop until old age. And so there's a lot of interest now in how early environmental enrichment, early environmental stress can affect the type and the amount of diseases that people uh, develop in adulthood. Now, so we now get to, we've looked at neuroscience basis underlying adult and child mental health and neurological disorders. Well, what has neuroscience done to repair brain damage? And I've just chosen three examples. One on robotics, one on deep brain stimulation, and one on new drug development. Uh, many uh, people uh, with uh, amputations of their arms or legs rely on uh, neurorehabilitation. And using uh, heavy and learning rules developed by Don Hebb and uh, neuroengineering, this is from a, a, a journal uh, biomedical Circuits and Systems Conference, uh, using uh, neuroscience uh, theory of Donald Hebb, using the idea of neural circuits, and using robotics, people are building artificial limbs that can learn. And here's a learning uh, paradigm, a neural network, underlying learning in an artificial limb, and then these limbs can be used in neurorehabilitation for people with stroke or brain damage involving a motor impairments or amputations. So motor recovery after stroke involves developing new neural connections, acquiring new functions, and compensating for impairments. If that's not possible, people can develop robotic arms. So the role of neuroscience in understanding the motor system helps to improve recovery of motor behavior after stroke uh, for Parkinson's disease, for amputations, and other things. So this is a, an example. This is a paper in June uh, 2015, only a few months old, on the role of neuroscience in neurorehabilitation. The second example is the idea that we can put electrodes into the brain and stimulate different areas of the brain to improve the symptoms of various diseases. Uh, the earliest was on Parkinson's disease, but people are now looking at depression and other uh, mental health disorders and, and neurological disorders where an electrode can be placed in the brain and uh, placed with a neurostimulator uh, with a battery that can be controlled uh, by circuits in this, uh, in this computer or reset by external computers. And so we look at the neural circuits underlying Parkinson's disease, the subthalamic nucleus, etc. The neural circuits underlying depression. So here, then, uh, this is a paper from 2003, the early days, the early days of deep stimulant brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, where they looked at stimulating the subthalamic nucleus or other basal ganglia, the substantia nigra, the globus pallidus, etc and then the motor uh, cortex. And so for each patient then, the area, the exact area for stimulation has to be worked on. Every patient is an experiment. And then once the electrode is implanted, it can get uh, stimulation and feedback and help the patient improve their motor behavior uh, when they have Parkinson's disease and reduce the amount of drug treatment required so the patient can become quite functional again. Uh, likewise, for depression, there are many different areas that people have looked at. This is a paper from 2005, 
on deep brain stimulation of different brain areas for depression. The hypothesis, chronic high frequency stimulation reduces neurotransmission through inactivation of voltage dependent ion channels. The same ideas that we use for Parkinson's disease now used for depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, cluster headache. So cluster headache, ipsilateral ventral posterior hypothalamus, obsessive compulsive disorder, the capsula interna, depression, the subgenual sub cingulate region and other regions shown in the figure. So the contribution of neuroscience, basic neuroscience research to understanding the circuits involved in depression suggest places where they can be treated with deep brain stimulation. Uh, here's just two examples. 2010 paper from Deep Brain Stimulation for Epilepsy and a 2013 paper, Deep Brain Stimulation and Other Types of Stimulation, Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation for Migraine. So things that were only science fiction 10 years ago, 20 years ago, are now being used in basic neuroscience leading to suggestions of how to interrupt neural circuits uh, these treat the symptoms, they do not cure the disease, uh, but they make life much better for people suffering from these disorders. The third example is one that's been less successful. Uh, how to develop new drugs for neurological and mental health disorders. And things have not been so successful. Here's a paper from 2012 talking about nanotherapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. And the issue is uh, the lack of success in the development of effective therapies for Alzheimer's disease uh, because of the complexity of the brain and possibly the complexity of the disorder itself. Uh, so there's the problem, this discusses drug delivery systems, how to get drugs across the blood-brain barrier, how to get them through into the cerebral spinal fluid. So many of us uh, are interested in using animal models to develop new drugs for Alzheimer's disease. And here's the animal model system, the animal models that we want to use, and here's all the different uh, approaches that people have used uh, to look at taking issues from clinical human syndromes, uh, trying to identify targets for new drugs, optimizing the drugs, putting them in animals and seeing the effects on animals, and then clinical trials, and finally marketing them uh, for people to use. Uh, very few drugs that are developed with animal models pass these phase uh, three clinical trials, and the question is how to improve that. That's the question we discussed in our uh, big review of Alzheimer's drugs and our review of drugs for neurodevelopmental disorders, how to improve the whole pathway of development of treatments for these disorders. Um, one interesting approach is to go back uh, to we say drugs that traditional healers use, drugs the witch doctors use, go to plants, plant uh, chemicals. And there's a number of interests now. This is a paper in press in Neurochemistry International for alkaloid candidates against Alzheimer's disease and how plant alkaloids might work as new drugs. And in the many trips I've had to Nigeria, I've been working with Sunday Bisong, who was here as a graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow. We've been working with, neuro, uh, with Nigerian plant uh, extracts to look at our animal models. So in our lab, we use animal models to try and uh, understand the neurodegenerative processes with age in these models. Uh, and then once we define the neural and behavior deficits in our transgenic mice, we try and repair them. And then look at whether these repairs will work on humans. And we have a number of uh, contracts with different drug companies, but I want to show you one set of data that's quite remarkable that Sunday Bissong and I hopefully will continue to work on after this uh, pilot studies. And this is using the Rewolfa vomitoria and looking at uh, the effects 
on learning and memory in the five times mouse. And here's different doses of Rewalfa uh, vomitoria, uh, showing that the uh, Rewalfa improves learning, it improves memory, it improves motor function in these mice, and that it reduces uh, A beta plaques in the hippocampus and the motor areas and auditory cortex. So now that we have a Nigerian plant that we hope to go on with in the future and look at how it has an effect on learning and memory, on motor behavior, and on areas of the brain. We're continuing to do research with this plant. And one of the reasons I wanted to be in Nigeria today is to talk to people about continuing research with this plant extract in Alzheimer's model mice, but also in Parkinson's model mice and some others. And so I'm hoping that you will invite me for a third time to Nigeria and we'll have third time lucky and I'll be able to spend some time working with people to develop these uh, drug treatments for Alzheimer's and other disorders. Well, in uh, 2010, I published in the archives of Ibadan Medicine an article that I presented at a SONA meeting in Egypt on how to set up a neuroscience program in African universities. And since then, that's been published in a re rewritten and published in a book, which I'll show you later. But I'm going to go over a quick a summary of what I said in this article. Um, if you can get the archives of Ibadan Medicine 2010, or I'll give you the other reference online. And so I said in seven steps, because seven is a nice number. And first of all, we have to realize that neuroscience is multidisciplinary, and that a, a neuroscience program doesn't need to cover every aspect of neuroscience. It can start uh, with behavior genetics, or it can start with cognitive neuroscience, or it can start with neuroanatomy. It can start with neuropsychiatry, or neurology, or neuroimmunology. But there is a whole range of neuroscience these days, and a neuroscience program can have different areas of this. Normally in Africa, it starts with anatomy or physiology and spreads to other areas, to pharmacology, etc. Well, the first step that we did at Dalhousie, uh, where we have a four-year undergraduate program, is we developed, as far back as 1989, it's hard to believe it was so long ago, an integrated undergraduate neuroscience program with psychology and neuroscience, biology, chemistry, math and statistics, genetics, organic chemistry, uh, biochemistry, neurogenetics, and specialty classes and laboratories in different areas of neuroscience, and then an honors thesis with specialty seminars, as well as electives. And in our program, students can take electives. They can take neuroscience and chemistry, they can take neuroscience and biology, or they can take neuroscience and theater, or neuroscience and history. So they get a wide range of educational opportunities. And in Africa, where some of these aren't available, there is a wide range of virtual neuroscience programs that can be taken from the uh, World Wide Web, TED Talks, electronic textbooks, uh, other neuroscience resources, the Dana Alliance for Brain Initiatives, Society for Neuroscience, uh, European FENS, uh, European Neuroscience Societies, Nature, Science, Ebro, and uh, it turns out the web has all my previous lectures I've given at Africa. So uh, uh, traditional classes with textbooks and professors can be enhanced with information from the World Wide Web. The second step obviously is to develop a master's and PhD program of scientific research in neuroscience, which often requires pooling resources. Uh, in Dalhousie, we have a minimum number of classes for graduate students. They take a neuroscience pro seminar, they take statistics classes, classes in neurogenetics and information technology, some specialty seminars, but mostly they focus on research design and methodology. And the PhD is almost all research with a few extra courses thrown in. And many of these are interdisciplinary. My students have uh, done projects in anatomy, physiology, physics, chemistry, and I have one in history now. 
history of neuroscience. And so there's a wide range of opportunities. The, the basis of graduate student research for masters in physics and PhD is really multidisciplinary cooperation where we need uh, in a psychology department, for example, we need cooperation with anatomy, biology, chemistry, physiology, pharmacology, and physics. Also uh, with computer science, neuroimaging, pediatrics, neuroendocrinology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, engineering for robotic arms, nursing, physiotherapy, and occupational therapy, and more uh, recently, as I'll talk about when I talk about neuroculture, philosophy, history, art, and music. So neuroscience can be integrated into the other sciences as well as arts and humanities and engineering, nursing, and health sciences. Step four really is to have uh, ethics committees at each university that uh, prevent uh, misbehavior in research. So human research ethics committees, animal research ethics committees, and the care and welfare of the veterinary care and welfare of animals being used for research. And these are extremely important uh, to maintain your research at a world standard, but also more and more every journal that you try to publish your results in will want a statement that your research design was passed and approved by an ethical committee, whether it's human research or animal research. Once you've set up a program, then the, the important thing is to be integrated with national and international societies. And so the International Brain Research Organization, EBRO, uh, has worked hard in Africa to promote neuroscience. The African uh, Neuroscience Society, SONA. Uh, the American Society for Neuroscience promotes brain awareness. Of course, now the 13th meeting of the Nigerian Society for Neuroscience and we've actually started a Canadian Neuroscience Society. In the past, Canadians always met at the American Society for Neuroscience. Now there's actually a Canadian Neuroscience Society, and I must say it's only about six years old compared to 13 years old for the Nigerian Neuroscience Society, so you're ahead of Canada. So EBRO membership uh, becomes important. They have scholarships and fellowships for students. Is at, SONA is part of EBRO, and EBRO has been important in classes and seminars and workshops and courses, but EBRO has changed in a way that I don't like. Uh, they focused on funding research centers in Morocco and South Africa, and to me they've neglected Kenya and Nigeria, and I've been trying to lobby, and I hope you will all lobby them to develop a national uh, Eastern and Western uh, Africa neuroscience research centers. I suggested we put one in Nairobi, Kenya, and one in Ibadan, Nigeria. And I, I wish you would lobby for these. And so we have four uh, stars in Africa of research centers in neuroscience. Well, student societies, it's important to have student involvement in neuroscience. We have a Dalhousian Undergraduate Neuroscience Society. Uh, there are graduate neuroscience societies. There are student involvement in all uh, neuroscience societies, FFN, EBRO, SONA. There are student awards for posters, student travel scholarships, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very rewarding for students to be involved in these societies. And finally, it's important to have community involvement, to uh, be involved in Brain Awareness Week, neuroscience in the schools, and be involved in non-profit organizations, as well as reaching out to government and industry. So uh, just in Nova Scotia, Canada, there are many non-profit agencies, uh, Alzheimer's Society, Autism, Brain Injury, Epilepsy, etc., etc. And there are also government agencies, health departments, education, pharmaceutical companies, equipment manufacturers, agricultural manufacturers uh, who are interested in invertebrate neuroscience both to kill off animals that destroy crops and to promote animals that fertilize crops and poll pollinate crops and animal breeders in, in animal husbandry and in, in agriculture. 
So all areas really of government and industry have some interest in neuroscience uh, that would help them promote uh, what they're there to do. And these societies, of course, are directly linked to basic neuroscience to promote uh, patient care and well-being. So it's important that their neuroscience society be involved in the community. Uh, Judy Isles at UBC and others have written this article in Nature Reviews Neuroscience in 2010 that discusses how neuroscientists should talk to the public, some issues that the public wants to hear about neuroscience. They call it Neurotalk, Improving Communication of Neuroscience Research. And the issues they raise are complexities of the brain, personal, philosophical, and religious, salience to mind and body, the burden of nervous system diseases and the impact on public health, and the problem of the stigma of neurological and mental health disorders. And these are discussion points that they suggest that uh, the general public is greatly interested in and the role of, of neuroscience research in these issues. Uh, as I said, uh, the article that was published in 2010 in the Ibadan Medical Journal, uh, I rewrote and updated uh, for Donald Pfaff's five-volume book, Neuroscience in the 21st Century. It's available online as well as in book form. Mine is called Seven Steps for Setting Up a Neuroscience Program in Developing Countries. Uh, it's 2013 and it's updated fairly regularly. And what's interesting is that uh, since uh, I wrote these articles, there have been new articles coming out. Uh, here's a me me metabolic a brain disease in 2014, an article on bridging the gap, establishing the necessary infrastructure for knowledge and teaching and research in neuroscience in Africa, highlighting stakes that have been uh, steps that have been taken to promote neuroscience in Africa by another group of people who are helping uh, to train African neuroscience students. And uh, another article in 2015 in the same journal, Building Sustainable Neuroscience Capacity in Africa, the Role of Nonprofit Organizations, uh, just the type I mentioned a little a minute ago. In recent years, science-based nonprofit organizations have been supporting African neuroscience community to build state-of-the-art capacity. So many areas now, since we began discussing this in 2009, 2010, have been interested in developing neuroscience in Africa. Well, oddly enough, my colleague, Dr. Kimron Shapiro, the head of psychology at University of Birmingham in England, I told him about my uh, proposals for neuroscience in Africa and he said, oh, we'd like to develop a neuroscience program at University of Birmingham. And so he used my papers and my articles, and I was a consultant for the new Human Neuroscience BSc at the University of Birmingham, and which includes that one girl from Botswana. And I based it on all the things I've just talked about. And in October, just last month, I was in Birmingham for a day uh, to give a, a talk on the opening of this program. And they uh, work within the British system to develop a three-year uh, program of required and optional classes of modules, and they have a range of modules. Uh, but it was very difficult for them to develop this program because in England, if you take chemistry, that's all you take. If you take biology, that's all you take. If you take math, that's all you take. If you take neuroscience, you want bits and pieces from a number of things. So they had to rethink how to build a multidisciplinary program at a university in a system where unidisciplinary programs prevail. So that was quite a challenge. And they have a number of research facilities at Birmingham that they advertise to students. It's focused in psychology with a lot of biology and chemistry and, neuro and, and engineering and other things thrown in. So they have developed particular laboratories. They've taken a piece of the world of neuroscience and developed it in their psychology department. Well, the last uh, substantial thing I want to talk about is training students for the future of neuroscience. Uh, a student today, will career will last for another 40 years. 
to 2055 or 2065. So we're not training a student for the 1960s or 1970s or even we're not training a student for today. We're training students for the future. So I look into my crystal ball and see what we need to do. So really students need to know basic neuroscience and of course they should learn neuroendocrinology since I've written about that. But basic neuroscience is the first thing. Secondly, they should know how to analyze behavior because you don't really know there's brain damage until you have a behavioral change. Uh, Pat Bateson has done this book on measuring behavior and I've written this article on how things can go wrong in the study of behavior. Students really need to know basic genetics now and how genes, brain and behavior interact and as I'm a member of IBANG's International Behavioral Neural Genetics Society and a former president of this society, I think it's very important to integrate genetic, epigenetic, neural and behavioral issues. Uh, learning epigenetics, as I mentioned, is important because there are external stimuli that can affect neurochemistry, which affect epigenetic mechanisms, DNA expression, messenger RNA, protein synthesis, and brain development and behavior. So the system is complicated. It doesn't really begin with DNA. It begins with the neurochemical and other uh, factors that act on promoters for protein synthesis and DNA transcription and translation. Uh, this is shown in this picture by David Sweat. It's a neuron, and there is a dopamine and serotonin. There is a second messenger pathways, protein kinase A, MECRT pathways, and here is the DNA wrapped around the histones, and here's the interaction of histone H3 acetylation to regulate a gene expression of that gene and protein synthesis. And so this neuron uh, requires not just neurotransmitters, but a range of second messengers, genetic potential, and gene activation in order to function properly. And at each step here, at each arrow, something can go wrong, as I talked about earlier. So a number of people, including my former student, Tom Brady, Tim Brady, sorry, have been looking at how epigenetics contributes to the development of neurodevelopmental, and neurological, and psychiatric disorders. This is a paper from Developmental Psychobiology in 2010 that focuses on how uh, external signals from the environment can activate epigenetic factors to modify brain development. As we collect more and more data in neuroscience, get big data, we really need uh, bioinformatics and neuroinformatics to manage the data. And here, Will Grisham has written an article on using, a, a teaching article on using neuroinformatics to integrate information gathered from websites dealing with anatomy, quantitative trait loci, bioinformatics, gene expression, etc. And this is in an educational uh, journal. We also need to use uh, neuroinformatics for data mining. There's so much information out there. We dig through the World Wide Web, we dig through journals, we dig through conference presentations to try and find information for our research project. So really understanding how data mining works is important. And this is an article in Frontiers, Electronic Journal Frontiers in Neuroinformatics. There are also many neuroinformatics programs online. Genes to Cognition, Blue Brain, Jack's Phenome Database, Allen Brain Atlas, etc. And all these are becoming essential for understanding the amount of data generated in neuroscience and applying it to particular problems. And so students need to know how to take a basic uh, behavioral data, brain data, uh, neuroinformatics, human brain data, and put them all together into a story, into a study of how they interact, the genes, epigenetics, brain, and behavior interact. And as I mentioned, students need to know how to speak about their research. 
not only to other students, but to people in the public and in hospitals. And I mentioned this uh, article on NeuroTalk. Uh, there's increasing pressure for neuroscience to communicate the results and social implications to the public. So students need to know how to present. They also need how to think in a, in a multidisciplinary way, how to apply what they learn in psychology and neuroscience uh, to medical problems, uh, uh, genetic, epigenetic, neuroimmunology, uh, neuro, uh, neurology, and mental health problems. So the biopsychosocial model of disease contains many elements that interact, and one needs to try and understand this. Now what about the future? Here we're training these students, we're setting up a neuroscience program, we're training students, then they graduate, and then what? Well, recently, uh, in May 2005, in the journal Neuron, uh, these authors wrote a little article called The Hitchhiker's Guide to a Neuroscience Career. So, well, what, what, what do you do once you get your degree, a bachelor's, master's, or PhD in neuroscience? What do you do? How mobile are you? How do you network? How do you build a CV? How do you enjoy neuroscience and, and, and profit from it? Neuroscience for fun and profit. So, this is a useful article for students to look at. There's also articles uh, in Nature recently about what scientists do for society. And many people don't trust science, and they don't understand it. And so what scientists do for society has become important to governments and industries and, and non-government organizations. And one argument is that academics train students to be academics. They don't train them for the wider society requirements. And that uh, publication, citations, and grant money focus on an academic career, but not on a public career. And so time working outside, volunteering, industry, uh, and other non-linear career paths should be encouraged. So a student who gets a PhD can go into industry, into health, and into others. And I give the example of one of my students who got a PhD in neuropharmacology and got a job in the patent office and her job is to review patents for new drugs. So it's a job in government, a job in industry that uses all her neuroscience skills, but a job you'd never guess someone would uh, have as a neuroscientist. With Ed Dalhousie, we've started this program. My colleague Aaron Newman started a program, the Summer Institute in Neurotechnology, Innovation, Commercialization, and Entrepreneurship. So uh, it's under the uh, title of Radiant Rehabilitative and Diagnostic Innovation in Applied Neurotechnologies. And the idea is for undergraduate and graduate students to get experience in translational neurotechnology of how to go out in the world and, and in hospitals, clinics, and other settings and look at how neuroscience and knowledge can be applied. And so we have several institutes on that and there's a Radiant website at Dalhousie that you can look at. And the interesting thing about training in science is it's not linear. A person who trains in biology doesn't necessarily stay in biology the rest of their life, nor a student in math or engineering. And this paper in Nature in July the 16th, 2015, gives an interesting picture uh, let's say where biology students end up. Some are in agriculture, some are in biology, uh, some are thrown out of university, some are in engineering, uh, some are in environment, humanities, human development, some left the university, and some are in social sciences. And the same with math and physical science graduates. They're all over the spectrum. And so training in neuroscience, which is multidisciplinary, should, like biology and, and maths here, uh, give an uh, opportunity for a wide range of uh, jobs in the future and places to work. Uh, lately, I've been invited uh, by people in the English department at Oxford to go to some conferences on uh, neuroscience, the arts, and humanities. And this is something you don't think about. Uh, and this is, again, a 2009 article in Nature Views Neuroscience on neuroculture. And neuroculture is the idea that uh, neuroscience concepts of 
spread uh, into films, into literature, into television, into video games, into visual arts. And so neuroscience is all around us now in movies that you might have seen, in novels you might have read, in television shows, etc. And so the wider society has become very interested in neuroscience. Uh, this is a little uh, web article from University of Toronto, Are We Living in a Neuroculture? Everywhere I look nowadays I'm seeing images or reading descriptions of the brain in some shape or form. He says, well, it's in movies, it's in books, but we also emerge new disciplines, neuroeconomics, neuroethics, neuroanthropology, neuroaesthetics, neurolaw, neurophilosophy, and cognitive, social cognitive neuroscience, and psychoneuroendocrinology, my favorite. So we really, in training students in neuroscience, are training them for such a wide variety of interesting careers that you could never predict uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Here's my friend at, at, at England, Edmund Rolls, was at Oxford and now he's retired in his war. He wrote this article in a journal that I don't really know that well in 2014 uh, on neuroculture, art, aesthetics, and the brain. And it's on how, we, how the brain appreciates art and what we find pleasant or unpleasant and what we like or don't like, what we find beautiful or not beautiful. And he shows different brain areas underlying art appreciation and appreciation of beauty. Again, something that might have been laughed at 20 years ago now has a place in the world of uh, neuroculture and neuroaesthetics. Well, my conclusion then is really neuroscience uh, training is extremely important. Uh, for students in Africa to develop understanding of neurological and mental health disorders and new treatments, for understanding uh, uh, the effects of the environment on neural development, for understanding how to, to reshape and, and, and repair brain damage and improve uh, development in children. And really it keeps coming back to genes, brain behavior, epigenetics, and basic neuroscience research and translation of this knowledge for public use. Uh, that the training is interdisciplinary and it's surprising how many places this training can lead to, all the way from basic anatomy to art, philosophy, and economics. So again, support for neuroscience training in Africa is essential and I, I thank you for inviting me and I wish I was there. Uh, thank you so much. And there I am. You know, you know this picture. Thank you.